afternoon uh, friends colleagues uh, gastroenterologists hepatologists not just from india but from overseas welcome to this uh, very interesting nafeld conclave 4 uh, when i say 4 it means there have been three before and i'll tell you a little bit about it uh, this is a very unique one and i think that because of covid we have had to do it in a web based format and i am really really grateful that all of you have spent your uh, valuable time to log in it's my uh, privilege and pride and honor to welcome all of you i'll just give you a little background about what it's all about and then i'll pass it on to the others So this is the fourth Nafeld National Conclave, uh, Conclave on Emerging Therapies, and uh, it says Web Series One, which basically means that there are going to be six of them, and this is the first. So it's the opening one in which we have, of course, three major stalwart speakers. We have Arun Sanyal, of course, and then Dr. Shiv Sarin and Donna. Uh, you know, while one pandemic is going on, and everybody is obviously obsessed with it. there is yet another call it a pandemic or a major epidemic going around also a more chronic one and that's of nafeld and the figures are pretty astonishing we know that about 24% of the people have nafeld about 50% of the people in the adults have diabetes and there's a very high prevalence of nafeld in indian males so to tackle this problem which actually extends almost a little beyond just therapeutics to lifestyle to whole lot of things we have this conclave to update ourselves on what has been the recent um, learnings that we can translate into practice these are some snapshots of our previous conclaves and we started way back in 2017 18 19 and this time we have the one for 2020 but in a different avatar and the reasons for doing it in this manner is obvious because of the covid pandemic and the need for social distancing we can't have a normal conclave so obviously everybody is resorting to the web and so are we um one of the important issues is that uh, i've often felt and my senior here dr shiv sarin is here and he'll bear me out that every time there is a crisis you can look upon it as an opportunity and i would actually look up on this as an opportunity of trying something different so the last time when we had our conclave there were about 550 registrations this time we have 1500 up till now and not only that we have a whole lot of registrations from other countries which would have been difficult had it been just a national conclave uh, the other option is the other issue is that you know it's far more easy at this point in time without having to resort to international travel to get the expertise of international faculty which we really look forward to and we are privileged in having dr arun sanyal has been our course or program director all along he is still with us this time we have donna here we'll just introduce her a while later and then we'll have a few more coming in in the subsequent ones one of the major challenges has been that ever since lockdown was announced in india on the around the 20th of march there has been a spate of webinars and dr shiv just mentioned that there are two webinars in which he has to speak today so it's on an average several medical webinars going on almost every day and there is something called a uh, webinar fatigue so one of the challenges of the organizing group and the advisory group is how to overcome the the webinar fatigue and still have something new and fresh for people so that's the freshness of a flower so you know the freshness lasts for a short time and yet you need that freshness to make any meaning the topics that we'll be covering will be contemporary topics nafeld and covid which is a very hot topic and we have none other than shiv to talk to us about it newer aspects of therapeutics you know new medicines are coming into india and of course there's a lot of research going on globally we will be going back or falling back to certain old wisdom focus on lifestyle and diet and to lead that initial part of the discussion we have donna here you'll hear about from her 
uh, we will hear a little bit about patient perspectives. Whom are we treating and what do they feel about it? And we hope to have a whole lot of case-based discussions so that this just does not re remain a theoretical web-based webinar. I have privilege uh, and honored in acknowledging these people. Our course director is Dr. Arun Sanyal, who will be formally introduced, but you have all met him in the last three webinars that we have had. And we have three patrons. We have Dr. Shiv Sarin, we have Dr. S.K. Acharya, and Dr. Y.K. Chawla, all great luminaries in the field of hepatology. And we have a young group of organizing committee, Dr. Kaushal Madan. He also, by the way, happens to be the Secretary General of the Indian Association for Study of Liver. Dr. Niraj Saraf, Dr. Manav Vadhavan, and Dr. Rinkesh Bansal is the organizing secretary. He is my junior colleague in the department. And we have a fairly impressive advisory and executive board. Almost all the who's who of hepatology in India are here. And I'm most grateful to them for being part of this whole journey over the last four years. Uh, I must tell you a little bit about HOPE, which banner we have been doing this for the last four years. HOPE is actually an acronym and it stands for Health Oriented Programs and Initiative. We started in 2004 with the WHO and the United Nations. And initially it was focused more on schools. So school health awareness, school to community approach, community work and so on and so forth. When I moved to Gurgaon, after being in Lucknow for 25 years, we expanded into including doctors in this awareness campaign. And this awareness obviously is cutting edge scientific awareness that's the part of what we are doing and uh, we have a impressive presence in schools and we have been raising awareness on issues of health you know of hand washing for instance much before covid came in and dr palni swami has been part of it also from the south and several of you have joined in with this this is the map showing our presence in the country this is for hope initiative primarily of course for student activities in schools but now we are expanding to other areas as well. Some snapshots. Uh, the idea is not passive education of giving lectures, but getting them involved into being more aware and being more participatory in the whole process. So this was the last picture. This was with Dr. Palni Swami in the month of March 2020. Can you believe it? Just about 10 days before the lockdown, I was with him in Tamil Nadu and we were doing a program in a school after a medical conference. And these are some of the books that we have published and they're in circulation as a part of a co-curricular activity in many schools. Uh, several awards, but awards don't mean anything until the health changes. And of course, we have done quite a few educational summits for doctors since 2015, two years since I came to Delhi. So with that, I must uh, conclude, but I must just remind our speakers that we have got the best of speakers and we will have the best of them in the next five as well. Um, my humble request to everybody is that medicine can get as complicated as you want to make. In fact, there was a very interesting uh, talk by a physicist who once asked me, why are your medical books so fat? And I was, uh, you know, literally struggling for an answer when he helped me out. And he said that, you know, whenever the knowledge is a little more certain, it gets crystallized. Like everybody knows Einstein's E equals MC squared. But medicine is still rather voluminous. So at the end of the whole sessions, six sessions, I would leave it to the speakers and especially Arun to try and see how we can crystallize what we discuss so that these can be implemented in day-to-day -day practice to make lives better. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And I must tell you that uh, we look forward to an interesting session this time. Uh, I'll just name three people here whom you can see. One is, of course, Professor Shiv Sarin, who obviously needs no introduction. Uh, Shiv, would you like to raise your hand? Yeah, that's Shiv. He's look, looking the youngest, actually, although he's pretty senior, by the way. He was my uh, senior registrar when I was doing my uh, residency at All India Institute, and he has always been a guide all along. I have Dr. P. N. Rao with me. P. N. Rao, 
He is from Hyderabad, a very eminent celebrated hepatologist of India, and Dr. K. R. Palni Swami from Tamil Nadu. Again, a very old colleague and an eminent name in gastroenterology from Tamil Nadu and India. I have uh, three other people. I'll just introduce you, Dr. Uh, Kaushal Madan. Kaushal, uh, yeah. So just mentioned that he's the uh, Secretary General of the Indian Association for Study of Liver and a very active um, educator now. And above him on the panel, you can see Dr. Professor Ajay Duseja. He's a professor of hepatology at PGI Chandigarh and one of the big names in uh, NAFLD research and management in India, a uh, big name. And we have Dr. Rinkesh Bansal, who's a director of gastroenterology and hepatology at the Fortis Memorial Research Institute. Uh, Rinkesh, you can just identify yourself. Okay. With that, I'll actually uh, mute myself and I'll ask Dr. Kaushal to take over and uh, get on with the next talk. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Good evening to all. Thank you for uh, introducing the concept and congrats to you for your the work your foundation does for the country. So uh, he's already informally introduced all the chairpersons. So we have three chairpersons today. Uh, Professor Sareen, he is currently the director of Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences. Uh, everyone knows him actually. He's got more than 650 publications related to the field of hepatology and gastroenterology. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Padma Bhushan Award. And he has been a past president of uh, Indian Society of Gastroenterology, uh, Asia Pacific Association of Study of Liver Disease, International Association of Study of Liver Disease, and is also currently the uh, chairman of the steering committee of uh, Asia Pacific Association for Study of Liver Disease. He is also the editor chief of uh, Hepatology International. In addition, we have uh, Dr. P. N. Rao who is currently the director and head of uh, hepatology at AIG hospitals in uh, Hyderabad. He is also the president-elect of Indian National Association for Study of Liver Disease and in October he will be taking over as the current president. We also have uh, Professor Palmi Swami uh, who had earlier been the head of gastroenterology at Stanley Medical College. Currently he is heading the department of gastroenterology and hepatology at Apollo Chennai. Uh, he is also a recipient of the prestigious Padma Shri Award and also the past president of uh, Indian Society of Gastroenterology and the Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy of India. So with these introductions, I request Dr. Palni Swami to uh, take the thing forward. Dr. Palni Swami. Good evening. I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Chaudhary for having given me the opportunity to be one of the moderators today. I'm honored to introduce uh, Professor Sanyal, Arun Sanyal. Uh, Professor Arun Sanyal is the director uh, and professor, Virginia Commonwealth University, Richmond, Virginia. And he has published more than 300 scholarly uh, papers. And Dr. Sanyal has won numerous awards for research and leadership. Earlier this year, Dr. Sanyal was selected for Virginia Outstanding Scientist Award. And Dr. Arun Sanyal is the leader in identifying the mechanisms and clinical outcomes for the management in, uh, of NAFLD and metabolic syndrome. With this brief introduction, of course, I can say not, not more about Dr. Sanyal. With this brief introduction, I would request Dr. Sanyal to begin his uh, lecture on treatment and, goal, treatment and goals in the management of uh, NASH. Thank you. Uh, good. Uh, I guess it's uh, evening there now, uh, but good morning from the U.S. And uh, uh, wonderful to see old friends and many new friends. And uh, uh, let's get this show on the road. Uh, before I start, uh, I just also want to add a couple of lines. Uh, you know, we're living in incredible times, uh, uh, you know, forced upon us by the COVID-19 but also in terms of social change around the world. And I think I want to take a moment first to really first show my support to the movement in the US, uh, Black Lives Matter, but also I think this is a moment for all of us around the world to stop for a second, think about our own lives, our own attitudes, and try to really 
use this as a moment to uh, make our entire society as a human race around the world uh, a better society that is uh, that has less bigotry and uh, is a more just society. So with that, let's get started with the management of Nash. We, we have a global problem. Along with COVID, this as Gore mentioned, we have a pandemic, but pandemic is not just of NAFLD. The issue fundamentally is that we're consuming too many calories. As shown in this map, you can see the caloric density of daily meals around the world shown in sort of a heat map. And what you can see over here is that, say for example, in India, the average Indian is consuming over 2,600 calories per day. If you go slightly north, you will find that in China, uh, there's a substantial proportion of people who are eating well over 3,000 calories per day. The issue is, are we burning 3,000 calories per day? Because at the end, it's quite simple actually. You have a balance between calories that you take in and the calories that you utilize. And if you take in more than you utilize, you have excess calories that the body has to figure out what to do with. And converting it into fat is the most energy efficient way of storing excess energy. Now, so we have a global pandemic of increased adiposity. Please be note that I'm being very careful in the words I choose uh, because I, this is not simply a matter of body mass index. It's really a matter of adiposity. And this is particularly relevant in Asia because this excess adiposity may not be easily visible to the naked eye. And unless you look inside the person's body and look inside their abdomen and their viscera, you will not see the excess adiposity. But if you think about diet-induced obesity and adiposity, this leads to metabolic stress, systemic inflammation, and fibrosis. The consequences of this include organs all over the body. So if you are a cardiologist and you have tunnel vision, you think this is all about the heart and you get coronary artery disease, you, you can get hypertension, and more recently, recognizing heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. If you're a hepatologist, if you're working south of the diaphragm, you think it's all about NAFLD and we have a big NAFLD epidemic and uh, that's the entry point. If you're a diabetologist, you think it's all about diabetes. And if you are a nephrologist, you think it's all about chronic kidney disease. The reality is, most of our patients have some combination of these at the same time. And the reason for that is it reflects the common biology underlying each of these end organ diseases. So it is really important to understand that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is part of a multi-system disorder. Because we are specialists, because of our training, we always have an organ-centric view of the disease. But the reality from a patient-centric point of view is that all of these are happening at the same time, or some of these. Now, in terms of how does having liver disease impact outcomes? There have been several meta-analyses. Now, I will tell you that the literature is extremely weak in this respect. Most of our data come from retrospective, poorly designed studies, and the problem with retrospective studies is not what you measure, the problem always is what you are not measuring because the studies were never designed to ask that question. But with that caveat, the best data we have are shown over here in the form of the results of this meta-analysis done by Dr. Dulai and Rohit Lumba. And what you see here on the left is that all-cause mortality starts rising even with stage one disease and of course is highest at stage four, and liver-related mortality starts increasing with stage two disease and uh, is highest with those with cirrhosis. Of course, this is because fibrosis stage tells you how close you are to cirrhosis, and cirrhosis leads to liver-related uh, outcomes, and of course, this then fibrosis stage tells you how close you are 
to those liver related outcomes. And this is shown, this is data from Finland and Sweden. Uh, this is Dr. Hagstrom's data. And uh, essentially what I want to point out over here is that the, if you look at these Kaplan-Meier estimates where the outcomes mortality is shown as a function of fibrosis stage, the conclusion of the paper was that fibrosis stage directs uh, the clinical outcomes. But if you actually look at the Kaplan-Meier, if you forget the abstract and the one-liner that the editors or the uh, authors put in there to catch everyone's attention, you would clearly see that the thing that really makes a difference in outcomes is cirrhosis. The dotted line at the bottom pulls away from everything else while the others are all clustered at the top. And what this tells you, it's not just about fibrosis, it's really cirrhosis that kills you. And anytime you include cirrhosis in a mix of F0, F1, F2, F3, and F4, F4 has such a big impact on the patient that it makes all the other F stages look much better than they actually are as predictors. Very, very important point. And I think particularly in a country like India, where the quality of hepatology is probably as good, if not better than any other country in the world, uh, it is very important that we raise the bar in terms of intellectual understanding of this, because there are too many sound bites out there about, oh, it's all about fibrosis. Fibrosis is a biomarker that tells you how far you're on your way to cirrhosis, and but it's actually cirrhosis that kills you. And this is shown more recently. This is uh, data that we are working on finishing up the manuscript. We presented this at ASLD last year. And this is a prospective analysis of clinical outcomes in a prospective adjudicated outcomes uh, that were measured in 2,000 patients followed prospectively for 10 years. And uh, as you can see over here, most of the outcomes are increased only when you get to stage four. And interestingly, you will notice the green line at the top, uh, which is the uh, increase in MERC score to 15 or higher. You can even see about four or five percent of people with stage zero and two develop this over time. But that's mainly driven, driven by underlying diabetes and uh, development of chronic kidney disease, which raises the MERC score and not necessarily the liver disease. This, of course, raises a very important question. If you have people who have ongoing simultaneous hypertension, atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, myocardial stiffness and remodeling, CKD, uh, burning out of the pancreatic islets, and burning out of the liver, why is it that some people will develop CKD and uh, actual renal failure first? Uh, some people will get their heart attack first. Some people will develop cirrhosis first. So I think a major unmet need in the field is how to subsegment the population better. And instead of talking about silly things like maffled versus naffled, we need to focus better on trying to understand the subpopulations within this very heterogeneous, larger population of patients uh, with fatty liver disease. We further know that while we're making progress with many different obesity-associated cancers, such as colorectal cancer, the, we are not making some good progress with respect to hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are data from the US CDC. This is, of course, US data. And in the US, the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma has increased by 3% every year for the, from 2005 to 2014. We don't have the data past 2014 yet. So basically where we land from learning all of this is that things really start changing when you start scarring down your liver. And our focus, if you think about the journey of the patient like a metro line where you have multiple stops, when you have NASH with high activity and stage two to three disease, that is a very important stop because that's where the train really starts picking up speed and you start moving towards cirrhosis because from stage three to stage four, when you get there, that's when you start having a substantial increase in clinical outcomes. And that's your point of intervention. That's the person you wanna treat and what you're trying to prevent are those NASH-related cirrhotic outcomes, 
so that you do not have those liver outcomes. Uh, and so the goal in the short term is to reduce, uh, improve histology, and in the long term, to improve clinical outcomes. So what can we say finally? We know for sure that NASH can progress to cirrhosis, and cirrhosis is clearly associated with high morbidity and mortality. The limitations and uncertainty in the current data uh, is that most of it is retrospective. The sample size are, uh, for most studies are not sufficient to account for all the key confounding factors. Uh, there are variable case definitions used, and there is some discrepancies from study to study in terms of how they relate to what we are actually seeing in terms of mortality figures. But even with that, we do know that progression to cirrhosis is really ultimately from a liver point of view, what will kill the patient. And so our principal goal and focus is to prevent cirrhosis in this population. And if somebody has already developed cirrhosis is to prevent outcomes. So our goals of therapy so that to meet with goals uh, ask to keep everything simple and crystallize it. Our goal is to look at the competing risks for the patient and try to attack all of those risks. So from a patient-centric point of view, not a hepatocentric point of view, patient-centric point of view, our goal is to reduce cardiovascular risk with weight loss, atherogen limit, treating the atherogenic lipid profile, reducing vascular inflammation, monitoring for arrhythmia risk, and stabilizing diastolic dysfunction to reduce hyperglycemic complications, prevent and stabilize CKD, and prevent early detection of cancer risks and ultimately prevention of cirrhosis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Professor Sanyal, for that wonderful presentation and uh, taking us through the goals and objectives of treatment in patients with fatty liver disease. Uh, I think before we go on to the next talk, I think I would like to remind the participants that, if, that you can post your questions uh, in the comments section and we will have the discussion uh, of all the three party uh, speakers at the uh, end. Uh, the secondly, I think all the participants, I think, uh, must be seeing a audience poll and we will suggest you or request you to participate in that poll and we can have the, you know, the results of that poll in between. Uh, so I think let's move on to the next talk now. This is a uh, on the um, global patient perspectives and patients with uh, fatty liver disease. And I think, I don't think we can have a better person um, to speak on this topic. And she's a, a donor crier. And why I think she's the best person for this is maybe for two reasons. One is that she uh, is the founder CEO of the uh, uh, Global Liver Institute, uh, which is a uh, patient-driven um, non-profit organization which operates in U.S. and Europe. Uh, but the other major reason I feel is that uh, she herself has been a patient of chronic liver disease, has undergone liver transplant, and she knows the journey of all the you know chronic liver disease uh, patients and all. So I think she would be the best person to give us the patient perspectives on um, NASH uh, and fatty liver disease. So Dona, over to you to take us through this journey. Thank you so very much. Um, greetings to everyone watching. And uh, on behalf of the Board of the Global Liver Institute, particularly our, our doctors, Rohit Satoskar and Ms. Amita Shukla, um, I so wish, I was so looking forward to being there in India with you to presenting. But I, I thank you to the entire organizing committee uh, for welcoming in this patient voice and the patient perspective as part of this very important conversation. Um, so I'm going to share my screen for a moment and, and uh, spend the next 15 minutes with you, um, walking you through a little bit about the Global Liver Institute and the, uh, the patient experience and journey, which at this point is um, quite uniform across geographies, uh, surprisingly. Um, whether you are a patient in, in India or Europe or the United States, um, that journey is marked by confusion and fragmentation and stigma. So the Global Liver Institute, uh, much like this conclave, started working in NAFLD and NASH in 2017. We launched uh, with a, an event um, uh, convening 
uh, people through our NASH Council at the Milken Institute uh, School of Public Health in Washington, D.C. And we did that with the uh, intention to position uh, NAFLD and NASH as a public health issue. Um, as you've spoken earlier, it is a parallel pandemic. Um, and as Dr. Sanyal um, articulated so very well, um, it really is a whole person, multifaceted disease with connections to, uh, to diabetes uh, and to heart disease and that cardiovascular renal spectrum. And so it was so important for us that from the very beginning that we created a very large tent um, across specialties, across patient advocacy organizations, across um, medical societies and institutions and ultimately countries as, as we have in our international NASH day. And so the role for, of the Global Liver Institute is that of a convener, um, whether it is uh, questions, education, uh, advocacy, issues of access, um, or, or policy, or supporting uh, research. How can we uh, contribute to creating a clearer understanding? Uh, I love the Einstein quote. Um, how can we create a more unified agenda? And how can we catalyze um, action? And so our attempt to coalesce, to synchronize activities and scale community efforts um, has, has been our, our, our three-year organizational journey um, as we lay things out. And so we do that in a variety of, of ways. We have our liver health policy update, um, our NASH news publication, uh, the NASH council, which has grown to 70 members. And I, I hope to add more from, from, from India uh, after, this, uh, after this talk. And uh, as well as our Beyond the Biopsy campaign, you know, we look across the landscape to see what are the greatest challenges to patients and to the field. Um, and we certainly saw the, the lack of non-invasive technologies and, and biomarkers um, and a reliance on liver biopsy, that if you tried to take that to scale, it really would limit, um, limit the field. It would limit patient access to therapies that are being developed and, and, and now are being successful. Um, and so that uh, campaign. We're so excited to be able to partner with Dr. Sanyal and the FNIH uh, Nimble Consortium around uh, advancing non-invasive technologies. As Dr. Sanyal also pointed out, the connection between NAFLD and NASH and liver cancer is so important. And so our Growing Liver Cancers Council um, is a very important part of our NASH efforts. And then uh, I'd like to speak to, to our Advanced Advocacy Academy. So um, equipping patients with the education and tools to go into their communities, talk to other patients, um, provide education and support um, has been so important because as I'll, as I'll walk you through, so many NASH and, and NAFL patients feel so alone and feel as if the questions that they have um, are going unanswered and that they had no one to turn to. So the uh, patient leaders who are being trained in our Advanced Advocacy Academy are really crucial part of our mission. And finally, having uh, just recently uh, had a international NASH Day, um, it's so exciting that um, we have been able to um, partner with 80 different organizations across 22 countries um, and and to not only shine awareness on on NAFLD and NASH and that's so important in this time when it's sort of everything is COVID but we have to understand that patients um, disease didn't stop liver patients uh, need for a NASH screening uh, for participation in NASH clinical trials uh, for the continued development of, of NASH therapies and for, for those that, that are available uh, for patients access to those to those therapies uh, and being connected to treatment did not stop just because of COVID-19 and so it was even more urgency around being able to talk about NASH and catalyze actions um, this year in 2020. So 
what we uh, have seen across the NASH patient experience and the NASH patient journey and how we have sort of looked at those issues and problems and tried to uh, analyze them and provide solutions that would meet patient needs um, is, is what I'll go through in these next few moments. Um, but, I'll, but I'll start with some of the, the comments and the, uh, the questions that, that I hear from patients um, so frequently. Um, the most told story is, oh, my primary care doctor told me 15 years ago that I had a little fatty liver, but don't worry about it. Uh, and now they're saying I need a transplant. And, and I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm devastated. My family is devastated. Um, or, uh, you know, they told me I have, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but I don't drink. So I don't understand. Or how do I tell my family I have a liver disease? Because there's, there's so much, there's so much stigma. I, I'm so, I'm so ashamed. Um, did I bring this on myself? Uh, because I ate. Um, what I hear from, from patients, I, I remember I was sharing a, a, a taxi cab with a, a, a young uh, Marine, a, a, a service member. So someone, you know, very young, um, someone who had expected to be at the, at the top of health. And when he talked about his uh, diagnosis of NASH, he looked at me and he's like, you mean there's, there's nothing? He's like, there, there's just, just diet and lifestyle. And so, you know, on the, on the, in the time that it took us of that taxi cab ride between where we started and, and to the airport, I, I told him that, you know, in the same way that he had the courage and the fortitude uh, to be able to uh, fight for his country, he needed to fight for himself. And he needed to rally all of the tools that we were starting to assemble. And yes, lifestyle and diet changes um, and exercise and increase in lean body mass um, to fight for himself until we could have um, better answers for him. So those are just a few of the um, you know, statements and conversations I have with so many patients um, around the world um, that flood into us every day. And I'll take you through this a little more uh, methodically. So um, the, the biggest barriers that we see along the patient journey that the Global Liver Institute tries to address are, first and foremost, the levels of awareness. Um, secondly, the reluctance to screen. No consensus around screening. Um, no clear clinical pathway. And then, as I was alluding to, the, the psychosocial issues um, that, that surround this. So in terms of the levels of awareness, um, as you know, and that why it's so important to participate in, in conversations like this, um, most people have not uh, heard of NAFLD or NASH. Um, you know, there's such low awareness of liver diseases, um, particularly outside of Asia uh, itself. And so to be able to start to talk about, about NASH um, we needed to build that firm um, foundation. It, it's so devastating for so many patients to start discovering uh, that they have NAFLD and NASH, but other members of their care team, uh, sometimes uh, they'll say, well, but the nurse had never heard of it. Uh, she didn't believe it. They didn't think it was a real thing. And so how can you wrap your mind around and, and wrap your, your family and your lifestyle around a, a condition um, when the care team around you either doesn't know about it or doesn't believe in it or dismisses it. Um, it, it really is a cause for so much disconnection of patients from uh, just the monitoring and care that we could be giving them at, at this time and that they will need for, for years to come. And so, that you know is why we've developed uh, several edu uh, educational uh, materials in 12 different languages and growing, and why International Nash Day and all of the uh, connections and infrastructure that we build through International Nash Day uh, to deliver uh, Nash uh, and NAFLD education around the world 
throughout the year is so uh, very important and really is the core component because you know you can't solve a problem that you haven't defined that you don't speak about um, it's particularly important that primary care doctors um, understand uh, and prioritize NAFLD and NASH. Certainly, you know, uh, the hepatology community has recognized it and knows it, uh, is conversant in it, but uh, because uh, it will likely first be uh, diagnosed uh, in a primary care or internal medicine environment, it's so important to reach out to, to primary care and also those um, sort of uh, NASH adjacent uh, specialties like uh, cardiology and, uh, and, and diabetology, or endocrinology, uh, to make sure that we're adequately you know, like capturing um, all the patients um, early enough so that we can start to prevent those later stage complications. You know, the reluctance to screen um, because of the complexity of the disease, um, talking to internal medicine physicians, they, they have said, you know, is there a simple test like A1C? I, I, I can do that. But, you know, these, you know, Fib4, ELF, uh, you know, fiber scan, liver multi-scan, what am, what, am what am I supposed to do? Come back to me when you have an answer, when you have this one, uh, you know, one test. Um, and in the overall uh, short period of time you have with, with a patient or the patient has with the physician to describe what's going on, particularly if they also have um, diabetes and hypertension and uh, high cholesterol. Uh, you know, there are, everyone is overwhelmed with, you know, which patients um, should be should be screened. And what does that what does that screening look like. And so the more that we can define that, the more that we can streamline that for uh, both the clinical workflow as well as the patient journey that matches, um, the, the easier it will be, the more effective it will be, um, the more patients will, will not be uh, lost to the system and, and, and left to um, advance uh, alone um, until they end up with complications or cancer or the need for transplant. And so, as I said, that goes into the consensus of screening and, and the work that we do in our Beyond the Biopsy you know, initiative. You know, having had six liver biopsies myself, um, you know, my, my interest is, you know, in non-invasive technology comes, comes quite honestly. And um, it's, a liver biopsy is necessary, certainly in some circumstances. But as we start yeah. to think about um, treating uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of patients across the next uh, several years and several decades, um, scaling up biopsy with its risks of bleeding, of sample error, of, uh, and, and, and the like, um, is not something that is feasible. It's not something that as a patient I would want to go through more, more than once in, in, in the journey, and it's not something I would want to, um, you know, in, inflict a, as a you know, as a policy um, on, on my fellow, my fellow patients. And so it's very important that we, uh, that we get this part right. To the uh, clinical pathway, um, it's... Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, thank you, sorry. Actually, I think that uh, Dr. Sarin has to leave at 5.30, so we are running a little late. So okay. you just... Uh, yeah. I, will wrap, I, will, I will wrap this up. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much. So um, since I've already addressed the silent cycle social issues, I'll, I'll, I'll end here with this part. Um, it's exciting to see the development of fatty liver disease clinics to provide a one-stop shop for because uh, shuttling between um, a hepatologist, a gastroenterologist, primary care, uh, your diabetes care, maybe a nutritionist, um, it is really just a too much of a patient burden. And so one of the biggest things that we can do for NASH patients is to bring the care to them and to simplify it and use this as an opportunity to address um, the whole patient and make sure that their liver issues, their cardiovascular issues, and their, their renal issues are all dealt with. And ultimately, I think that can improve uh, 
patient health as a whole um, and improve public health. So thank you so much for allowing me this time with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jonah, for the hurdles which you've been facing and also the response by the Global Liver Institute to raise the bar of awareness about the fatty liver and the NASH in the community in general. It's now my turn and then my pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Shiva Sareen. He's been an alumnus of All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I tell you, he's an embodiment of hepatology as far as I'm concerned. In the sense that through the portals of a GB pump and the one and only Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences in Delhi as a director, and there is no part of hepatology where there is no contribution, be it an experimental, clinical, transology, basic science hepatology, critical care hepatology, epidemiological, transplant, nutrition, and preventive hepatology. You can see that this contribution is there already. Someone has told that the amount of publications which have been covering through all the portals of hepatology. And now currently, his ongoing contribution to the current pandemic is evidenced by the series of webinars through Apazel platform. And also, the ILBS has created a platform for an online acquisition of multicentric data on the liver and then COVID. So it is understandable that we have to look upon ourselves, you know, what is happening in NAFLD and the current pandemic. Over to you, Professor Sareen. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will uh, like to thank uh, uh, all the kind words you have spoken and also to all the other members. I'm sorry I have to rush because of uh, another uh, session which is at uh, 5.30 and uh, I had asked whether I can join uh, later uh, if possible. Uh, so I have to go to the share screen and I will start right away. Uh, and if time does not permit, I will uh, come back after Dr. Sanyal's uh, talk. Let me see if I can go. Uh, on share screen and do it. Uh, is it visible to everyone? Are my slides okay? No, no, not as yet. No, as yet. Uh, so, uh, is this okay? Yes, yes now you're on. Uh, thank you, and I bring greetings from ILBS, and I'll cover the spectrum of liver injury in COVID, uh, briefly NAFLD to MAFLD liver injury profiles. So the first is, are liver disease patients at high risk for getting COVID-19? This was part of a survey, uh, just got published yesterday after a huge insult by many editors. APSL COVID liver injury spectrum, the APCOLIS-1 study, which had 408 patients, 43 with cirrhosis, 185 CLD without cirrhosis. And it shows you the type of acute liver injury at admission during hospital stay and separates compensated and decompensated cirrhotics. This is the largest database for liver disease and COVID. And as you will see that the incidence of having COVID infection may not be susceptibility alone. It's also disease-based is more in those who have decompensated cirrhosis. Also, the incidence of liver injury also was higher. In fact, four out of five in decompensated cirrhotics. Mortality in those who did not have CLD versus those who had cirrhosis decompensated and those who got liver injury was much higher. If the CTP score is less than nine, mortality was low, but the moment the CTP score is nine or above, the mortality, the hazard ratios increase several fold. So it shows that patients with liver disease, if they get COVID or SARS-CoV-2 infection, they have a greater predilection. So like diabetes, like hypertension, liver disease, should be considered as a comorbid condition and should be given a priority in management 
of patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection. We have an ongoing large global survey called APCOLIS-2 study, which shows us the patterns and changes in attitude of hepatology practice called CLAP COVID. You may join it just by clicking at this uh, link. A study which was recently published in JHEP also confirms that cirrhotics, if they get this infection, rather than bacterial infection, the mortality is two times. Also, cirrhotics with SARS-CoV-2 versus non-cirrhotics, the uh, injury and mortality is high. This is to show you that 30-day mortality overall is higher in these patients, in those with liver-related mortality versus COVID-19 disease-related model. So nearly double of all those which are relevant. And also they have compared with MELD if it is high, 15 or above. In fact, three out of four nearly, or two out of three would die. The question is, how does the virus get into hepatocyte? It doesn't have an ACE2 well expressed in a normal hepatocyte. But when the hepatocyte is injured, then there is an expression of ACE2 receptors, and this may permit, and there are very recent electron microscopic pictures showing some lipid droplets, but they have not confirmed the presence of spike proteins inside. So the question remains, how is the injury? Is it a bystander injury? or it is a direct viral hepatitis. Most likely it is a bystander injury. And the liver failure is a result, as I'll come later, is because of the hypoxic damage. Nephel to Mephel, the king and the mover is Dr. Sanyal and the group. And in fact, he says, don't worry too much about it. And I agree with him. Whether you call it metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver or Nephel, in fact, it's a more generic term. And these slides have been borrowed, some of them from Dr. Jacob George. This only tells you that about 30% or 30%, India falls in that red zone of NAFL. This was the global consensus where we all voted for a change in terminology. And this means the new data shows currently we call NAFL, ALD, Steatosis and NASH. And what you're going to include, maybe a little heterogeneous, is to include cryptogenic cirrhosis, metabolic associated, alcohol, and there will be lipotoxicity. So I think it's a much wider spectrum, and we will have to go into generics much more. These slides are already published just to tell you that when you are in Asia, you may have 23 or so as overweight and obesity about 25. So you may have a metabolically abnormal, but a normal weight or a lean weight. And this is very important for us to recognize that hepatic steatosis can be and NASH can be in these groups of patients. I will now move on to liver injury in MAFL, the spectrum, mechanisms and potential therapies. This diagram tells you in a normal liver, SARS-CoV-2 can cause acute liver injury, three times rise in AST, ALT, rise in bilirubin or so. It can also cause a very small proportion of patients in acute liver failure. In fact, one case report. Mild rise in AST, ALT is seen in 22 to 50 percent of the patients. Now you have chronic liver disease and that could be HBV, HCV, alcohol, and they can cause an acute decompensation or ACLF. And as I showed you in the Apollo study, one in five, 11% had acute decompensation and 9% has acute on chronic liver failure as per a parcel definition. MAFL forms into a group of chronic liver disease, but it can also be on either side. I have put it onto this side of the chronic liver disease generally because by the time you appreciate it, please, but it can also be on either side. I have put it onto this side of the chronic liver disease, generally because by the time you appreciate it, the patient generally has an AFL was seen. The pattern of liver injury, as I said, 
was seen in about 50% or so. Very few had rise in alkaline phosphatase. Of those patients who had normal liver function at the presentation, admission, then the liver function remained well in half and liver dysfunction occurred in the other. Those who had liver dysfunction at then the liver function remained well in half and liver dysfunction occurred in the other. Those who had liver dysfunction at presentation, nearly 33% had progressive disease. And in fact, the percentage of patients who may have more injury is also more in this group. And the viral shedding is also longer and higher with patients who have underlying NAFLD. Another letter to editor. Uh, it's difficult to get publications now. A letter to editor shows if someone has MAFLD and has a high FIP4, more than 2.67, the injury and the odds ratios are much higher. Even if you adjust it for diabetes and obesity, even then in the adjusted, there is a higher injury. And this is higher than mere obesity alone. So obesity, which can be just peripheral, it can be in the adipose tissue, but liver-related obesity or fatty liver disease itself is a huge risk factor, and we should include it into the COVID risk factors. Normally, ACE2 expression is low, as I told you, but I want to tell you and re-emphasize MAFLD is more higher risk than pure obesity or diabetes. And once the damage starts in these patients, it is progressive. Look at pure obesity and this adjusted. Another study which has been published here, obesity versus MAFLD. So when you have an unadjusted and an adjusted model, in this, there is just mild increase, but still it is substantial to say that MAFLD can add further. Now, how is the damage? The largest number of macrophages in the body are in the liver, and they are the source of releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha. And of course, in MAFLD, you have an impaired innate immunity. It's unclear if the risk is specific to NAFLD or underlying metabolic milieu, and therefore, we do not know what causes, but it is certain it is not a viral hepatitis. Yes, the cascade of events increases and it is an oxidative injury. A cytokine storm develops in COVID-19, sometimes in severe disease, which is resembling the secondary HLH, very high ferritin, D-dimers, TNF-alpha, IL-6. And there is an increase in GCSF and many other cytokines. This is also to show that the virus, whichever cells, pneumocytes or cholangiocytes or enterocytes, the final process is that there is an increased cytokine release. Sorry, I have to rush because of the other uh, webinar. And this paper, very, very important, just published in Gastro this month, is about IL-11. And I wanted to say that IL-11 is the new kid in the block for NASH. And there is an injury into the stellate cells. There is an injury of immunocytes. And if you inhibit IL-11, you can actually improve liver functions, hepatocyte dysfunction, and the stromal-derived inflammation. And in COVID-19, there is a cross-reactivity of SARS uh, nucleocapsid protein and the IL-11 gene, which is highly induced. This is, very, this is not part of this study, but this is very recent other data to show that IL-11 levels increase tremendously in these patients. This is about IL-1 and anakinra, which is being used for alcoholic hepatitis. So this is the other cytokine. And use of this in this LEN study showed that compared to no treatment, placebo versus IL-1 inhibition, the survival rates significantly improved. This is the first paper using 
a, a IL inhibitor, interleukin inhibitor, where survival and going to ventilator has been shown. So to summarize, the therapies for COVID and what we use at ILBS are generally soft because we are not very sure about others. So we are still using sofosbuvir. We might start using favipravir for moderate disease. And these are all liver patients. And remdesivir, we have used only in one patient, but we are very careful about liver injury. We are regularly using DEXA. We are using pentoxifiline. We have been using convalescent plasma therapy if there is an HLH-like situation. We have used IVIG, and we are trying to get anakindra for our patients with liver disease. At a given time, we have 10 to 15 patients of severe liver disease with COVID infections and that's a huge challenge and a learning for us. So I'll now summarize that patients with uh, NASH, Nephil or Mephil are more susceptible. They get more severe injury, much more than obese and diabetics. The acute liver injury is progressive in them quite often. It can lead to decompensation or acute and chronic liver failure one in five. The injury is hypoxic, very often mitochondrial, and therapies are very limited. Thank you for your kind attention, and I'll be happy to join back uh, the discussions and to answer more questions. Thank you all. So uh, thank you, Professor Sareen, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I understand that you have to leave for another webinar. And uh, would you be joining us back for the yes. discussions? 5.50, I will be able to join you back at 5.50 or 6, definitely. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll wait for you. There are a few questions for you. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we move on to the next talk and possibly the most exciting uh, uh, issue which most of us and uh, want to know. And it's very apparent from the questions which we are receiving. Everyone wants to know about the future of uh, treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And again, uh, to answer that particular issue, we have none other than Dr. Arun Sanyal to talk to us about the future landscape of NAFLD treatment. Professor Sanyal, please. Can I just interject one minute? Uh, Donna, um, sorry, there were two uh, last points which were very crucial in your talk. No, I'm fine. Thank you so much. Uh, if there was a beautiful talk, there were two points which got left out because of constraints of time. I think the last one was psychosocial and the, there was one prior to that. So if you don't mind, after Arun's talk, once we head for the question and answers, uh, can we request you to come back and complete that little part? I think they're frightfully important for patient counseling. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that opportunity. Arun, sorry for the interruption. All yours. No props, no problem. Okay, so uh, we talk about the therapeutic landscape for NASH. Uh, since we're talking about drugs, it's important to show my conflicts of interest. Uh, okay, so our first question that we wanted to start with today was, in a patient with NASH, which is the root cause of the disease and the most appropriate target for treatment? Extrahepatic factors, abnormal de novo lipogenesis, oxidative stress, and stellate cell activation. And very interestingly, I was looking at the results. They are fairly evenly distributed around 20 to 20, 20%, 26%, 33%, and uh, 20%, 20%. So fairly evenly distributed across the four, which actually, if you are in the business of, uh, in the science of writing questions, generally means most people are confused about the answer. So here it is. Teaching point number one. NASH is not a primary liver disease, but a victim of extrahepatic circumstances. And the reason we can say this is not because of any beautiful basic science, but a simple test experiment of nature that we do clinically. When you do a liver transplant, you put in a brand new organ. In fact, we will often do a biopsy to make sure that organ has no fat in it. And so you put in a liver which is devoid of fat 
into a person. And we published this now 20 years ago, and it's been re replicated multiple times, that within a matter of months to years, the liver is full of fat, and the curve for steatohepatitis is just shifted to the right. So that tells you the extrahepatic milieu drives the accumulation of fat in the liver. This is a very, very important point to remember, which again brings us back to this issue of root cause of increased adiposity, metabolic stress, which is driving multiple end organ disease in our patient. So as liver specialists, we're of course very interested in the liver. But if you have to take a patient-centric view, what you want is to make the patient better with respect to all of the end organs that are diseased so that they can ultimately have better outcomes in the form of clinically meaningful benefit. Clinically meaningful benefit is defined by how a patient feels, how a patient functions, and how a patient survives. So it is not enough for us just to stop the liver disease, but we also need to pay attention, whether we do it by ourselves or whether we do it as a team with our collaborators in the field of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, that depends on the individual circumstances. Now, if our goal is to improve all the end organs, and what I've listed at the bottom of this slide are the drugs for which there is scientific evidence of benefit and the approaches that are potentially beneficial. And what you see over here in red is that one of the most common things that benefit all these different end organ diseases is weight loss. And weight loss is, again, you, you know, people use this word very generically. When you say weight loss, what you really mean is reducing adiposity. Losing muscle mass will also give you weight loss. That's not good weight loss. And that's always frequently a problem, particularly in our cirrhotic patients. When we tell them if they don't lose weight, they will not be transplant candidates. They go start starving themselves. They lose muscle mass, and they actually clinically decompensate. And so it's really important that the messaging is uh, done correctly. So talking about weight loss, we usually recommend cutting down on food. There are 5,000 diets, depending on whether you are a food faddist or you are a common sense person. You may go for one or not. Uh, but ultimate bottom line is if you take in 5,000 calories and you only burn 2,000, you have a 3,000 calorie that you have to account for. And it doesn't matter in what form you take those excess calories. The other thing that is lost in a lot of these dietary data is that lifestyle is more than diet. It's how we live our life every day, our daily stresses. And there are zones in the world which are, uh, you know, uh, considered the blue zones or places where people have long life expectancy, such as in Okinawa, Icaria, and so on and so forth. But over there, it's a total lifestyle that, that is associated with longevity along with genetics. So the answer is not that simple and not a simple function of what they're eating alone. So here are some data in a real world cohort of 2000 patients uh, in the US. And Essentially, we're looking at just in a regular clinical setting. This is not a trial with some structured weight loss program. This is just looking at the efficacy in a real world setting. So 33% of patients lost some weight, but 80% of them regained it over time. And, and this basically shows you the subsets and the sensitivity analyses. And you can see everything sort of intersects the unit line, indicating that the body is really defending the barostat or the weight that is set for that individual person very, very aggressively. And so it is very hard to break through with just our usual garden variety advice that we give to our patients, which separates the rationale why we need to do more than just tell people to go out and lose weight. And for many patients, telling them to just go out and lose 30 pounds without actually giving them the tools without understanding the barriers for that individual patient, for engaging and sustaining lifestyle changes, 
you might as well try to tell them to fly to the moon. You'll have the same level of efficacy uh, as you would if you ask them to flap their arms and fly to the moon. So having said that, let's move on now. So this is a topic, the lifestyle issue. Hopefully at the next conclave, we, will, we can do a deep dive on because we really, we, we give it lip service, but we do not as a specialty pay attention to the details of why lifestyle changes do not work. In the same fashion, we would attack pharmacological treatment. Now, moving on to pharmacological treatment, this is anchored on our current understanding of the pathogenesis of NASH, uh, which is basically a four-step process where metabolic overload to the liver drives cell stress and cell injury, which then triggers an inflammatory response. Inflammation begets more inflammation and eventually leads to fibrosis. And the progressive fibrosis leads to a remodeling of the liver into what we recognize as cirrhosis. So because the first upstream target is metabolic overload, it's not surprising that the majority of pharmacological targets are around this area with the idea that if you can slow that gear down, then all the downstream gears will eventually slow down. So here we go for our second question. In selecting a drug for the treatment of uh, uh, NASH, uh, what is your uh, uh, top priority? Antifibrotic benefits of the drug, mechanism of action targeting the metabolic root cause, established benefit on liver as well as heart and kidneys, or the safety profile. So I just wanted to see how every, there is no right answer, by the way. We just want to see they're all right answers. So uh, I just wanted to see what, how people think. And turns out antifibrotic effects, 25%. Mechanism affecting metabolic basis, 37%. Established benefit to heart and kidneys, 26%. And uh, safety profile, uh, 9%. So maybe I would say, you know, the only teaching point here is that you are going to put a person on a drug for a very long period of time. So our current way of thinking for drug treatment of NASH is like treating hypertension and diabetes. Once somebody goes on it, since you have not cured the disease in its root cause, like a pneumococcal pneumonia, you really are planning to put the patient on long-term treatment. So the safety bar for treatment is extremely high. And I, this is something that I would again reiterate. All the other points are very well, very important, but I would say I would put the safety profile of drugs at the same level as all of those other mechanisms of action and established benefits points of view. So I, I, I could give this talk and talk about, you know, all the different drugs that are in clinical trials, but you know, there are a lot of webinars nowadays. I think Gore mentioned the web webinar fatigue, and I'm sure you've all been on other webinars uh, where we talk about a lot of different drugs. But what I thought I would focus this down is on the drugs that have recently been approved in India, which are available to everybody, and this would make the conversation more relevant. So, so starting with PPAR gammas and its role in NASH, we know that PPAR gammas are involved at the level of the adipocyte, as shown in the cartoon on the left, uh, where it reduces fatty acid oxidation, uh, fatty acid, where it reduces uh, lipolysis and reduces uh, the release of fat from adipose stores, and at the same time increases adiponectin. So this has two consequences. One, that you are reducing release of free fatty acids and thereby reducing the fatty acid load to the liver. Number two, since the fat, if you don't stop eating, since that fat has nowhere to go. So you actually, if you keep eating at the same rate, fat is coming into adipose tissue, but now you're reducing lipolysis. So that fat is going to accumulate in peripheral adipose tissue. So you increase adiposity. Number three, you increase adiponectin. And by increasing adiponectin, you improve uh, sensitivity 
to insulin in the liver. And so in the liver, looking to the right, PPAR gamma has additional effects where through a transcriptional factor called PGC1-alpha, it affects mitogenesis. It also has an anti-inflammatory effect on hepatocellular, hepatic macrophages. And then PPAR gamma inhibits de novo lipogenesis and reduction of fatty acids, all of which then reduce the metabolic stress as well as inflammation in the liver, which should hopefully result in decreased uh, uh, fibrosis. And indeed, there's clinical data to support these. Now, the problem, of course, is because you cannot release fat from adipose stores, you gain adiposity. So you need a way to not only reduce lipolysis, but to help the adipose tissue burn off some of that fat and also, in addition, help the liver burn off some fat. So it makes sense to combine PPAR gamma with a little bit of PPAR with some PPAR alpha activity, which allows and uh, fat oxidation to go, go on and thereby reduces the accumulation of fat while maintaining the beneficial effects of PPAR gamma. And thus the cons rationale for a dual PPAR alpha gamma agonist, and that is saroglitazar. Now, as shown in this cartoon, which shows the mechanisms of action, we see over here through its PPAR gamma effects, it reduces insulin resistance. It impairs lipolysis, so it reduces the release of free fatty acids. But at the same time, through its PPAR alpha effects, it is improving fat oxidation. And in the liver, in addition to, uh, it also improves fat oxidation in uh, ketogenesis. And by doing so, uh, by improving the effectiveness of this, it improves reactive oxygen species. At the same time, by utilizing the free fatty acids in the liver, it is reducing autophagy and the ER stress and uh, all of the downstream inflammatory signaling uh, that leads to cell injury and cell death. Together, by taking away the drivers of uh, stellate cell activation, this should translate also into improved fibrogenesis. So we have recently just published, uh, I guess just a few weeks ago, uh, a paper in scientific reports looking at the effects of saroglitazar in an animal model of NASH that very closely mimics many of the close features of human disease. And as you can see over here, if you look at steatosis, compared to, we had four groups, chow diet, vehicle control with high fat diet, vehicle diet, high fat diet with pyoglitazone and with saroglitazone. And you can see that addition of PPAR alpha gamma on top of PPAR gamma alone produces a substantial decrease in hepatic steatosis. Hepatic ballooning went to zero. There was a significant decrease in lobular inflammation, and this resulted in improved NAFR activity score. As you can see on the right, this was also accompanied by an improvement in pericellular fibrosis seen in early stage NASH. Now, this is accompanied at a molecular level by decreased unfolded protein response and ER stress. You can see over here NRF2 expression in the middle going up, which indicates that the tissue is responding appropriately to oxidative stress by and therefore reducing oxidative stress. Consequently, on the right, you have less inflammation. You can see in the middle under phosphojunk, which is an important inflammatory pathway, the bands are much darker. And then when you add saroglitazar in, in the background of Western diet, you see that it goes back down. And so it is reducing inflammation. And, and then ultimately, it is also reducing uh, fibrosis. Now, in a human study, Phase 2A study, proof of concept, this was done in the U.S., presented at ASLV last year by Naga Chalasani. You can see, and I'll ask you to focus on the green bars on the right. You can see there's a 44% reduction in ALT with saroglitazar, 4 milligrams. 
And as you look at the percent change in uh, ALT at different doses, you can see again that sarogrid is a four milligram produces a big change in uh, ALT. And when you look at a common parameter that we look in drug development, which is proportion of people with 25% reduction from baseline ALT, once again, you can see actually even lower doses of sarogletazar uh, meet that endpoint. And then of course, the percentage of patients with more than 50% decrease in ALT is significantly higher in four milligrams of sarogletazar. And that is the approved dose. So then simultaneously, you can see an improvement in liver fat content with saroglitazar with an absolute change of about 4%. And you can, this is shown in the proportion of people with greater than 10%, greater than 20%, and greater than 30% reduction. And once again, you can see four milligrams saroglitazar very effectively defects the liver in almost up to 60% of patients. When you look at glycemic parameters, once again, you see on top of background uh, uh, diabetes treatment, addition of saroglitazar produces a fairly substantial drop in uh, fasting insulin, as well as fasting glucose. Fasting glucose effects are uh, more pronounced than on fasting insulin, uh, as you can see. So it's showing some effect on glucose disposal. And in the end, this translates into uh, better uh, home IR. Now, because of the small numbers, there's some variability. Uh, it is not clear exactly why the two milligram dose did not perform quite as well. And this is driven mainly by, in this study, the, uh, the fasting insulin did not change in this population. But the, keeping that caveat in mind, overall, there is an improvement in glycemic control and there is a reduction in insulin resistance. When you look at dyslipidemia, and this is, of course, what it was originally approved for, diabetic dyslipidemia, you see an improvement in triglycerides over and on top of background therapy over here, an improvement in HDL and an increase in HDL. Of course, there's a caveat that there's no drug known to mankind yet where drug-induced increase in HDL has translated directly into improved cardiac outcomes. But it's a good, nobody will argue that an in increase in HDL is a good thing. Uh, the total cholesterol goes down and market effect on LDL cholesterol on top of background therapy over here. So it really, in our patients who have significant background cardiovascular risks, this is actually a very good profile. And there's no profile for hepatotoxicity or no signal for hepatotoxicity. Now, uh, there is also been now growing number of studies where people have started looking at histology. So these are data from India. This is Shiv's study that he presented earlier this year. Uh, this is the pivotal trial that led to its approval in India. Uh, you know, uh, in the US, a study of this size probably would not probably would not uh, make it to pivotal trial, but very, very reassuring that if you look at the primary efficacy endpoint of a decrease in an AFLD score by two points or more. About 52% patients had it compared to 23% in placebo. And uh, this was spread over both all the components of NAS so without worsening of fibrosis, uh, and particularly for saroglitazar, four milligrams. Now, moving on. So there are additional trials that hopefully will be presented at ASLD with histology, but the data look all very similar. There is clearly an improvement in disease activity in the short term. What will be very important is to show in the long term that this translates into reduced fibrosis as well. Uh, now, moving on to the second major class of drugs that are approved is the, are the bile acids. Now, over the course of the last 15 years, it has become very apparent that bile acids are important players in terms of metabolic homeostasis. Now, the only way the human body can get rid of cholesterol is to convert it into bile acids, secrete it into the biliary tree, and as all of you know, bile acids undergo enterohepatic circulation and come back to the liver and they go round and round. Every time we eat, the gallbladder contracts, bile is released, bile goes in the intestine, 
and the bile acids are taken up by the intestine and circulate back to the liver. So bile acids not only are important in digestion of fats in the intestine, but these bile acids also provide signals to the rest of the body that nutrition is coming, allowing the body to reset its metabolic machinery in response to nutritional availability. And there is a tremendous amount of literature on the biology of bile acids and nutrition now. The key receptor that is involved in this is called FXR. And FXR is the cognate receptor for bile acids in the liver. And when FXR is activated, it shuts down bile acid synthesis and it increases bile acid secretion into the bile. So it gets rid of the bile acid, which can be hepatotoxic, is cytotoxic because of its antipathic nature. It gets rid of it by excreting it into the bile. On the other hand, when you come down to the intestine, when the bile acid is taken up, the intestine produces a compound called FGF19. FGF19 also feeds back and has a very FXR-like profile. And so both FGF19 and FXR are being targeted for therapeutics. Bile acids, in addition, activate L cells in the colon to release GLP-1 through a TGR5 receptor mechanism. And that has still not fully been uh, leveraged for therapeutics, but that is something to be looked for in the future. So bile acids have led to a variety of therapeutic approaches uh, that are not only being utilized for NASH, but also have relevance for other liver diseases such as hepatitis B, because we know hepatitis B enters the hepatocyte using the bile acid receptor and there are clinical trials currently ongoing to block the NTCP receptor that uh, bile acids use to enter hepatocytes to actually treat hepatitis B. So there are, while there are some open questions with respect to metabolic flexibility, incretin response, antibiotic effects and management of bacterial overgrowth in the intestine and the possibility of NASH being an FXR resistant state, there is enough data to provide a theoretical rationale to use FXR agonists to shut down lipogenesis and uh, also to reduce fibrogenesis in the liver. So this is being led by a compound called obetacolic acid, which is 6-ethylquinodeoxycholic acid, where a 6-ethyl group is added to the uh, sterile ring of the bile acid, which increases its agonism by, for FXR over a hundredfold. And I'll go straight uh, to the pivotal trial that was done, which is the REGENERATE trial, which is a three-arm study, obetacolic acid, 25 milligram, 10 milligram versus placebo in a one-to-one -one, one randomization, where the study had a follow-up biopsy at 18 months, which is an interim time point, where there were two primary endpoints, fibrosis worsening, improvement by one stage, or more with no worsening of NASH or NASH resolution without worsening of fibrosis. And study success was defined as achievement of one of these two endpoints with the idea the study would continue to clinical outcomes because ultimately we have to demonstrate, we have a responsibility to show that from a patient-centric point of view that all of these histologic changes translate into better outcomes for our patients. So the fibrosis improvement by one stage without resolution, without worsening of NASH is shown over here, where you see a stepwise improvement in the proportion of people. Now this is very statistically significant, but as you can see, the numbers are still relatively modest and there's plenty of room for improvement. But when compared to where we were, this is the first proof that with a drug-induced therapy, you can actually shift the needle and cause fibrosis regression, not just stabilize, but regression of fibrosis in patients with established NASH with F2, F3 disease. So, but when you look at NASH resolution, we see that these numbers are relatively flat and this did not show any significant improvement. So, but when you look at the natural activity scores, the activity scores do improve uh, with obetacolic acid. So what does that actually tell us? So here are the activity scores. You can see together as the score as a composite 
there's a stepwise and a significant improvement with 25 milligrams. Hepatocellular ballooning is uh, improved. Lobular inflammation is improved. Steatosis was a little bit mixed in, uh, as it, and contributed to why all of these didn't pan out the way they did. Now, why is it that the components of NASH, ballooning, inflammation, all get better, but you don't see improvement in resolution of NASH? And some of it is an artifact that is created by the FDA definition of resolution of NASH, where inflammation has to be zero or one, and, steato and ballooning has to be zero. So if you started with an inflammation of two, and you still have an inflammation of two, even though your ballooning disappeared, everything else disappeared, then technically you, do, you have not resolved your NASH. Similarly, what we're finding out is as long as there's residual steatosis, pathologists have a hard time discerning resolution of NASH, uh, calling ballooning to be absolutely zero. Yet, when you ask the pathologist to overall look at the biopsy in a masked manner and ask them if they think NASH is gone, they were able to say this with significance. So the benefits that we have shown so far with OCA is that there is decreased activity, there is decreased fibrosis. And we think this is reasonably likely to predict that over time, this will translate into decreased cirrhosis. Decreased cirrhosis should result in decreased liver outcomes and mortality. But these are all things that have not yet been shown it's reasonably likely that the short-term changes we've seen will translate into these long-term changes. But for our patients, we have to always think about not only the benefits, but the risks. Remember, we talked about safety at the beginning of the talk. And so there is one problem with pruritus, about a quarter and up to 50% of patients with 25 milligram dose complained of some pruritus, but it's largely mitigated by management and rarely needs discontinuation of the drug. So there are multiple uh, approaches to treat the pruritus. That's a whole separate discussion. There is another problem because you're preventing cholesterol from going into bile acids. The cholesterol levels go up and the cholesterol has nowhere to go. So it comes out of the liver and ends up in the LDL cholesterol. And of course, LDL cholesterol is one of the most important risk factors for atherogenic disease. But this can be managed with statins. and of course, we probably should pay some attention to avoiding, given that we don't have outcomes data with cardiovascular disease yet, uh, we should be a little cautious in people who have already have significant high-risk cardiovascular disease. But there's ongoing data monitoring uh, that is going on and data collection going on. Lastly, there are small number of cases of hepatotoxicity that have been reported. And there's a paper in hepatology earlier this year with four cases reported. And that, of course, is a red flag that requires further monitoring. So personally, there are no uh, uh, national guidelines on this, but this is my personal take. At this point in time, until the results of the ongoing trial in cirrhosis are fully presented, uh, for patients with known cirrhosis, I with or people with very high fib force, thrombocytopenia, early hypoalbuminemia, clearly those with decompensated cirrhosis, I would not use this drug. Similarly, for people with very early stage disease who are not, who have no increase in all cause mortality, I would not give any drug treatment for any form of NASH, uh, but focus more on lifestyle and the focus on the causes of why. Uh, they cannot engage in a lifestyle and work through them. This is your opportunity to do this in a non-toxic way. There are people who have unstable cardiovascular cells. I probably would avoid them. Also, people who have a lot of pruritus at baseline. You know, we don't think of NASH as a pruritic disease, but these clinical trials have shown that one out of five patients with NASH actually has significant pruritus at baseline when you actually do questionnaires, when you ask the patients. So we've learned from our patients about this. And lastly, there is a bit of a signal in the REGENERATE trial for acute cholecystitis and formation of gallstones. So I would recommend that we get an ultrasound before starting OCA. And in people with symptomatic gallstones, get the gallstones taken care of before engaging in OCA therapy. 
Similarly, there are some stopping rules. If the ASTLT increases according to the thresholds I'm showing, if the bilirubin rises, particularly the conjugated bilirubin, or the albumin drops, these are red flags. Those, this is typically, all of these things happen in the cases that have been reported with severe hepatotoxicity, and most of them occurred in the context of acute intercurrent illnesses. So do, if somebody gets acutely ill with some other disease, some other problem, they should stop the drug till you have a chance to recheck the liver numbers to make sure that their liver is safe before proceeding, restarting the drugs. And so, uh, or uh, if your platelet count drops, suggesting you have progressed to cirrhosis, you may consider stopping the therapy. I would restart OCA on a case-by-case -case basis only after careful consideration of the risks and benefits in the individual patient. So just to cover the profile of frontline therapeutics uh, over here. So if you look at thiazolidine dions, which are PPARC gammas, and look at what we set out as our goals of therapy, which is weight loss, improvement in atherogenic risk profile, reducing MACE, stabilizing GFR, improving glycemic control, and reducing NASH progression. TZDs do several. They're neutral with respect to MACE, but they do actually cause some increase in LDL cholesterol and they cause weight gain. Saroglidazar is neutral on weight. It improves the atherogenic profile. We do not have yet lots of high-quality data on MACE and stabilization of GFR. Glycemic control is improved. And I think we, it improves NASH activity. We need to see more histology-based data on NASH progression. And I think that overall sets the profile and tone for saroglitazar currently. And I think the clinical trials, when these are completed, will fill in, fill in all of these gaps. FXR, FGF19, they either lead to some weight loss or are weight neutral, but the LDL goes up. F FGF19 is injectable, uh, and there is some decrease in HDL, uh, but at the same time, triglycerides decrease. Glycemic control, they are more or less neutral. We do not have data on MACE or GFR for these either, and, but we do know, probably have the best data for fibrosis regression with the FXR group. FGF21 is another hepatokine that has effects centrally and on adipose tissue and in the liver. Very good atherogenic profile, causes weight loss, neutral with respect to glycemic control. We don't have MACE or GFR data, and there's no evidence yet about NASH progression. These Falcon trials should read out by next year, and we'll know the answer by next year. Thyroxine beta receptors focus primarily in the liver. They are flat in terms of weight because if they caused weight loss, you would have to wonder whether they're truly beta receptors because these are specific for the liver and not for the rest of the body. Good atherogenic profile. We don't have MACE or GFR data. Glycemic control is neutral. And again, like saroglitazar, the early studies show that it decreases activity, fibrosis signal is not as prominent as with the FXR group of drugs but I think phase three trials are ongoing. GLP-1s, you have to be aware of this because they do cause weight loss. They are neutral with respect to lipid profile, but they improve MACE, stabilize, improve GFR, improve glycemic control. And we know that recently, again, semaglutide uh, uh, published the top line results, 59% resolution of steatohepatitis, but the fibrosis signal was not significant. So I think, again, uh, whether the time course of fibrosis improvement is different for different mechanisms of action of drug is probably likely. And so we'll have to see in the long-term studies whether this translates into improved outcomes. So then that brings us to the last question, which is to try and put all of this together in the context of a clinical, uh, in the context of a clinical uh, uh, condition. Um, I'm trying to see over here if I got the results of this, uh, this one. Uh, I don't see the results of this question. But anyway, this is an open question. Again, uh, uh, there's probably no one right or wrong answer. But this is just maybe a good point to get conversation going for the Q&A session, which is a 49-year-old patient with type 2 diabetes presents with abnormal LFTs. He had an inferior wall MI four years ago. He's on atorvastatin, metformin, insulin, and empagliflozin. 
Viral serologies are negative and the patient denies alcohol use. Fibro scan shows a cap of 350 and a liver stiffness of 8. Urine shows some albumin. Creatinine is 1.2. LDL cholesterol is 130. Uh, which of the followings would you use to treat this patient? OCA, vitamin E, seroglitazone, or pioglitazone? And uh, Kaushal, do we have the results for this question? So unfortunately, I haven't received those results. Okay. I was supposed to get those in my... But you know, Arun, I just want you to uh, also take the opportunity to announce to the audience, this is exactly what we are going to discuss in the next webinar, where we will be talking about the therapeutic uh, options and where to fit it into okay. which situation. Okay. Perfect, exactly. I should be focusing predominantly on India as far as how we will uh, Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sanyal. That was, again, a wonderful presentation and taking us through the therapeutic landscape for NASH uh, patients in 2020, the drugs which are available and some of the drugs which we may soon, soon see into the market. So I think uh, before we go on to the Q&A, I think maybe we can request Donna to take one or two minutes to finish her last slide, which she was on before this. And then I think we can have uh, some questions and answers. A lot of questions have poured in from the audience. But I think before that, Donna, can you just take a minute or two and finish your uh, last slide? Yes. Um, I don't need to shift over to the slide. I'll, I'll simply address the, the issues right. that I wanted to emphasize. So um, when we think about the psychosocial issues that um, uh, NAFLD and NASH patients are experiencing and how U.S. physicians can work with them uh, to achieve optimal outcomes, really think through uh, three, three things from the, from the patient perspective, um, denial, stigma, and depression. So uh, because uh, NAFLD and NASH's early stages um, have very few overt symptoms. Um, uh, fatigue is the is the number one uh, most frequently cited. And you know who amongst us isn't tired? <laughs> um, but fatigue is, is another thing in, entirely. Uh, you know, as as a patient who has experienced end stage liver disease and, and transplants and, and post transplant now, mm -hmm. I, I think that. Um, there is many different levels uh, of, of fatigue as, as an Eskimo might have for the word snow. Um, there are so many colors and gradations to it, and we need to get a greater understanding of what an individual patient thinks about as, as fatigue. And to the point that Dr. Sanyal made about uh, pruritus, if you are working with a patient who uh, doesn't have any symptoms, and you put them on therapies or treatments that all of a sudden start to have symptoms, like and I've experienced that, and it, it's, it's, uh, it can be mind-blowing. It can be devastating um, at higher levels. We really need to be thoughtful about what the patient uh, can, can bear and, and what that transition uh, means for them. There is such huge stigma around liver diseases in general, around excess weight, um, and now having uh, NASH. And so we need to work and create that community um, to, to reduce that. And depression is an issue that doesn't often rise, it's not recognized as much in for liver patients, but certainly uh, we hear over and over again uh, the levels of depression. And so I would think that uh, working, working together, we need to think about illuminating, validating, and motivating. 
So illuminating the disease for, for patients through the types of screening and, and conversations that we have in the same way that um, a, a smoker um, looking at a picture of their blackened lung um, would be compelled to very different behaviors than if they didn't have that picture. So looking at screening mechanisms that give patients that visualization, that picture of the harm and damage that's actually happening to their liver. So this, the narrative that this is just benign, this is, uh, you know, is, is displaced by understanding that this is a chronic progressive damaging disease um, is really Im important. So illuminating is our first job, validating for patients that this is important, but also something that they can get in control of um, with, with help. Um, and validating it to their family that this is this is serious. This isn't just a little bit of fat in the way that we in diabetes it's often discounted as a little bit of sugar. Um, but this really is something uh, potentially dangerous um, to the cardiovascular outcomes as we've discussed, or to um, complications of ascites and varices uh, and transplant and and cancer, making those very real for patients to validate the steps we'll need to take with them. Um, and then motivating. Um, to just tell someone who is fatigued because of the disease um, and may be experiencing sarcopenia or muscle wasting um, because of the disease and saying, well, you're just lazy, you need to work out more. Um, we really need to come with a more uh, nuanced understanding of how to work with patients to motivate them and give them all of the tools to enact lifestyle changes and to adhere to the therapies that we're developing. So I think if we uh, address the denial, stigma, and depression and work on illuminating, validating, and motivating patients, we really help them deal with this very complex multifactorial uh, condition that is Napled and NASH. So uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Thank, thank you, Donna, I think for that wonderful perspective. So I think we have had large number of questions and many of them are actually related to the drug usage in patients with NASH. So I think let me clarify here that since Professor Chaudhary had clarified it earlier that we had five more webinars after this and one webinar would be thoroughly dedicated towards you know, individual drugs where we would take questions uh, specific to the drugs, but then overall in general approach of using these drugs, obviously we would be discussing uh, today. So let me start with the, the questions uh, to Professor Sanyal, and then I think Kaushal can direct some question to Professor Sareen, but the one question which I'm starting is a common question to both the speakers is, uh, that some of them, uh, some of the participants have asked about this changing terminology about NAFLD and MAFLD. And um, some of us actually thought this may be a little premature or may even create more confusion. So I think let's try to sort out this confusion here if possible. I mean, uh, though there's nothing big in the name, I mean, the disease remains the same. So I think can we have the opinions first on this, Professor Sanyal and Professor Sareen? Sure. Uh, so uh, I have to say I'm not a fan. OK, and I'm a little annoyed and upset that my acquiescence to be part of a manuscript in gastroenterology last year to raise the issue of the inadequacies of the terminology were translated into using my name as a supporter of this move. You know, 25 years, there's no question, the word non-alcoholic is inadequate and inappropriate and does not tell us, it's a non-term. But, you know, this is not 1995, we're in 2020. And the world has moved and NASH has moved out of the realm of academics. It used to be in the domain of us academicians, but it has moved out of the domain of, our, of the academics into a much larger multi-stakeholder space. And the most important stakeholder here is our patient. And so we have patients, we have policymakers, we have our colleagues in the diabetes world, cardiovascular field, et cetera. There's incredible lack of awareness of this disease across multiple specialties that we need to bring on in our fold if we're going to increase coordinated care of our patients. 
So uh, implications of name change in 2020 are very, have, are much broader than they used to be. And so you change name and change course if it will allow you uh, to better classify the patients in terms of outcomes, better classify the patients in terms of uh, predicting who will respond to certain types of therapies. You better, you change uh, course if somehow you improve awareness of the disease. You change course if you improve policy and access to care. You change course if it accelerates drug development. And you change course, you know, ultimately, if this will help shift the needle and the burden of disease in the population. And so in this priority list, uh, actually the exact semantic meeting, meaning uh, becomes less important. Now I will quote you, uh, since you opened the, this door of questioning, I will quote you, you know, from the Vedas, which hopefully some of you at least have some knowledge of, uh, that all words have three meanings. There is a literal meaning, and that's the lowest level of meaning. Then there is an etymological meaning, which is based on where the words are derived from. And then there is a contextual meaning, which is understanding uh, words in context. And that is the highest level of understanding of words. So while at a literal meaning, non-alcoholic is foolish and is a non-term, but you know, people have sort of begun to understand what it is, what that, you know, a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. So policymakers are finally coming around to understanding what this term means. And we are already setting policies, public health policies for screening, surveillance, and things being put in place. Our drug developing agencies, the regulatory agencies, finally beginning to understand the disease and coming to terms with it. Our, the way national surveillance is done and ICD codes are made, are already being changed to specifically address this. So if we shift course, there is a potential for, you know, uh, off target effects, if you will, on many of these. Very importantly, when we actually talk to our patients, our patients tell us that the word non-alcoholic actually is good for them because they can tell their family and everybody, it reduces stigma that, hey, my disease is non-alcoholic, okay? It's in the name, non-alcoholic. I'm not a drinker. I'm not some alcoholic sitting in the closet. So what the original intent was to have a larger dialogue with all stakeholders, including patients, policymakers, uh, third-party payers, all kinds of people at the table. And unfortunately, for reasons that are academically opaque. Uh, it took on a life of its own, and I think it, it is a rush to move a uh, little prematurely. And finally, last but not the least, alcoholic liver disease is entirely metabolically driven. So replacing one bad term with another bad term does not necessarily make any sense. And we could eat up this entire time frame uh, debating this, but I think this is what I have to state. Uh, there's a rebuttal paper to the JHEP paper coming out in hepatology. And of course, I'm completely open to hearing alternate points of view, but I don't think I really want to debate this any further beyond what I've already said. I think before I request Professor Sareen to give his viewpoint, uh, I, let me add another question to which has been asked that I think in the newer terminology of MAPFER, there is also a suggestion that you can abandon the terminology of NASH uh, so the, how about this distinction of NAFL and NASH, which we have been talking all around for so many years, and this is so important. So I think let's have your viewpoint, sir. Yes, me or Shiv? Yeah. No, uh, Professor Shareen. Yeah. Sir, you are mute, sir. Sir, you are mute. Okay, I... Actually, I'm happy Arun has, uh, Dr. Sanyal has mentioned because we were all going along because we undoubtedly believe his exceptional brilliance and vision all these years. So 
having not talked to him and still agreeing to the MAFLD was because you know sometimes you your reputation uh, you know precedes uh, actions and that was one of these situations if you ask me honestly i joined because uh, arun was uh, spearheading and i thought so now you want me my honest perspective we had in 2002 defined acute on chronic liver failure as amongst the first there is a hepatic insult which leads to ascites as an acute portal hypertension coagulopathy a simple definition now there is a definition of aclf which includes from everything 29 definitions are there in that it includes a definition of decompensated includes compensated chronic liver disease all kinds of things are there so nobody can develop a therapy nobody can understand which side of the tail or which leg of the elephant it is so when you look at in the same scenario mafld includes cryptogenic Includes alcohol. It includes pure fat related. So I think we should re-question our, uh, you know, terminology. I am very happy with Nash. I am very happy with NAFLD. There would be therapies. The only thing which it lagged was recognition by guys to say, look, this is a metabolic part. It is the core to all other diseases. So if we can achieve this with the NAFLD and Nash, I would stick to it. Okay. Furthermore, I would encourage everyone to look at a paper. The first author is uh, Shadab Siddiqui. Uh, this is from the Liver Forum, and this is for if you're going to develop a drug. Uh, at least I can tell you from U.S. and Europe perspective, that is sort of the breakdown of the disease, where you have to just like in heart failure, you describe. uh for heart disease you know you describe the etiology you describe the new york heart classification if there is valve involvement so there are different components to it so for full classic definition of the disease includes whether you have fat what is the degree of uh, activity what is the fibrosis stage and whether you have one two three four or five different etiologies so it's like a, a me- you know different columns and you just mark each of the columns but you have to address each of the columns because there is absolutely no reason why an obese diabetic person who likes to have a few drinks in the at lunch and a few more drinks at dinner cannot have multiple things contributing to their liver disease at the same time and so it is a bit of a continuum so you know uh, uh, please look at uh, shadab siddiqui's paper from 2018 i think or 19 uh uh in hepatology uh looking at what the fda how fda and the european medicines agency has uh, defined uh, uh and re- restructured and that should be sort of the starting point for such a dialogue i know there's a conference call with easel uh next tuesday i believe uh to discuss this further and there'll probably be a workshop next year uh to dig into this more detail and i would really like to also ask donna let's ask our patient what they I mean, think i was about yeah. to ask the yeah. donna you know donna do you think semantics matter yeah. and you mentioned four things dsd if you remember so the last was depression one was s was stigma and so on and so forth so uh, do you think the change in nomenclature could actually be harmful or helpful I think as as Dr. Sanyal said at this moment in 2020 when we are just at the point of having some momentum to introduce Nash to policymakers and so many different offices we're at this really important uh tipping tip well it's more disruptive than helpful um you know I'm married to a geneticist and lipid expert uh and uh, i've been uh, on the board of the personalized medicine coalition in terms of genetic diagnostics and so i look forward to an evolving conversation that does involve um more people more stakeholders as we come to create more knowledge and precision around the disease so i look forward to that conversation in the future but for in 2020 it's incredibly disruptive 
um, to all of the work that we've been doing around International Nash Day and creating momentum and clarity and simplicity um, to move this field forward. Okay, so I think let me move some gears now from terminology to, you know, again, some of the other questions. And the next question is, and I think we'll take both Professor Sanyal and Dona's view on this, about the, you know, um, assessing uh, the severity of uh, fatty liver disease, uh, the patient's perspective from Dona, mm -hmm. and Professor Sanyal would maybe tell us, the people are asking what would be the best way to categorize the severity, NAFL, NASH, NASH with fibrosis, other than liver biopsy or short of liver biopsy, how best can we do that? So I think maybe each one of you, you can give your perspective here. Sure. From the patient perspective, we want to understand uh, what are the implications of that stage? So at the Global Liver Institute, we talk about making sure that there's a solution for every stage. And so if you are in early stage, uh, you know, in the spectrum of NAFLD and NASH, then it's going to, the interventions are going to look like, you know, X, you know, lifestyle intervention. What, what, we, what are you going to ask me to do? What am I experiencing? And what are you going to ask me to do? And then what effect is it going to have? And then in advanced stage disease, um, how is that going to be different, more intense? Um, what do I need to do differently? How many more doctors will I need to visit? How many more complications experiencing? So those are the two big distinguishes when you understand and describe to patients that it's a spectrum of disease, a progressive chronic disease, and you're either in the early stages or the late stages. And then I think, yes, that inflection point um, at F3 um, starts to become meaningful for, for people to understand oh, this is a, at a really serious point and there's going to be a lot more involvement. So I think that early and late stage and the inflection point for patients are the three most important concepts to be able to get across. And so whatever diagnostics and other measures can help describe that best to people um, is what's needed at those different uh, chart points. Yeah, Professor Sanya. So I think this is such an important point. Uh, it is probably one of the most uh, rate limiting steps in how we are able to manage NASH. And uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, our knowledge base is anchored on histology. Now, as I mentioned, as I showed one slide, we have now completed uh, the NASH CRN database two study, which is 3000 patients followed for 10 years. Uh, and of whom we have longitudinal data in over 2,000 adults and about close to 1,000 kids. Uh, so that paper should be coming out soon, but that's anchored on histology, okay? But that's very important because our entire knowledge base in NASH is anchored on histology. But we also have, in the context of following these patients, data on non-invasive tools we, know, we have learned that bridging fibrosis cirrhosis are critical elements that drive clinical outcomes. So we are developing, so we already have measures such as FIB4, we have measures such as Fibroscan, et cetera, during this period. So we have started looking, uh, and I guess the next set of publications that we hope to produce uh, will look at these non-invasive tools to develop a pragmatic, classification of fatty liver disease. Get away from NASH, get away from, but you're doing it in an evidence-based manner, right? So, so basically, if you have fat and it's not attributable purely to the consumption of alcohol, in that setting, uh, to be able to use some simple tools to divide people into risk categories, low risk of a 10-year outcome, intermediate risk of a 10-year outcome, and a high risk of 10-year outcome, so we hope by having those tools, and then we'll compare it both to histology and see if a, if a combined model, including histology and clinical, is the best. But at least it will give us a non-invasive tool. And the reason we're trying to look at it in so many different ways is because some of our current tools yet lack certain degree of precision. And that brings us to the Nimble Consortium which is a very focused effort in the U.S. through the foundation NIH, to, of which, by the way, Donna, I managed to rope her into this as well. 
uh, is our patient representative to tell us as we develop non-invasive tools, what tools are likely to be acceptable for patients and how the patient perspective will be important in the implementation of those tools uh, to get better precision around some of the non-invasive techniques and tools. So I think in the next four years, uh, it will be a very different landscape in terms of the non-invasive tools. Currently, you can use a combination of FIB4 and FibroScan, I think, to get a reasonable ballpark estimate if you're not going to do a biopsy. The critical question comes in the people who fall in the middle. You know, They don't have very high FibroScan or a high FIB4, but they're not very low either. They fall in the middle. You know, Someone whose liver stiffness is, say, 10, and uh, their FIB4 is 2.2. What do you do with them? You know, do you biopsy? Do you not do biopsy? So there, you know, you have to really think how much will the biopsy help you in your decision making? Uh, if you decide to wait, uh, would you do, choose to go for a drug given that, you know, uh, even the currently approved drugs, we don't have all of the data that we need to be able to say we fully understand how this drug works. So that's, I think you have to make some judgment calls there. I think want to point out about biopsy as well. Um, when people start pointing to the, uh, any deficiencies in any particular uh, existing non-invasive uh, test or technology, that in the time and for the expense that I can uh, have a biopsy and lay there on my side trying not to bleed out, we can do all the non-invasive tests. We can take all the blood work imaging and put them all together and get all of that information in sort of the same amount of time and money. And so you know, looking at any deficiencies in any one particular non-invasive technology, I don't think is really the right discussion to have. Sure. I think uh, I have a lot of questions on pharmacotherapy, but Kaushal, I think Professor Sareen wants to say something and then Kaushal, maybe you can ask some questions on COVID and NAFL to Professor Sareen. I'm not sure this is the right day for your series of lectures, but since Dr. Sanyal is here and others are here, NASH in a large perspective is an immune mediated disease. You have to assess inflammation we just don't uh, assess the effect of the inflammation. That is fibrosis. And I don't think there are currently non-invasive tests which can carefully tell us about the types of cells or the type of inflammation or the degree of inflammation. But therefore, those who are in the gray zone, those who have not either started or have, at the end of the journey, we don't need it. But those which are in the running for getting to a higher or worse scale, I still feel liver biopsy is very essential. And that if you don't do it, you will only start treating like going into a dark room and trying this medicine and that medicine and indirectly. So I may be the outlier, but I would remain an outlier till a proper definite solution comes out. And I'm open to criticism. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, lots of questions pouring in regarding COVID also. And since Dr. Sareen talked about it and uh, he has some experience on uh, managing these patients who are sick with COVID and with liver disease in his center. So there are questions by Dr. Shain Sadashivam from Cochin and Dr. Manish Manrai from Pune, both asking what is the role of tocilizumab in cirrhotic patients who develop COVID. So have you had a different experience yeah. in cirrhotic patients when you give tocilizumab? Interestingly, IL-6 levels in the cirrhotics have never been so high. And in a normal guy, you will see something like 4,000, 2,000 to 4,000 levels. But in cirrhotics, the levels are 300, 250. And therefore, uh, it is not really very justified. But yes, we had two patients and one of them had a liver abscess, not really liver disease, who had a very high uh, IL-6. So there was a confusion. Can you give it in sepsis or you cannot? Second part, other than this patient in a liver disease scenario, whether you give IL-6 or you give plasma paresis is an open question. We have given uh, IL-6 inhibitor, TOSI, in uh, two patients but I would not recommend it for uh, routine use unless uh, the levels are in health. Uh, can, I, can I say a word about this? Yes. Uh, 
So first of all, I think a lot of how we think about COVID is driven from the early data from China. But a deep dive looking at the quality of that data suggests that a large amount of that data really is not very high quality. And that has led to a lot of confusion. And I think the fiasco with hydroxychloroquine is a great example of how misinformation translates and we expose a lot of people to drugs thinking that we are helping them when we really are not. And so to Gilead's uh, credit, uh, you know, the remdesivir trials were very rigorously done. The data are the data. You know, they have a modest effect early in the course of the disease. But that's what the data, at least we know what it does. Hmm. With respect to the so-called cytokine storm, we obviously, like everybody else, thought, oh, my God, you know, we've got to watch for the cytokine storm. And our experience with 400 patients that we have actually measured all of the cytokine profiles over here in, our, in my own center uh, is that really, you know, compared to the people who have CAR T that we routinely see, uh, the IL-6 levels are nowhere close to the CAR T profile. And this is the same data coming out of Mount Sinai from other places that have also seen large numbers of COVID patients. So I completely agree with Shiv that I think there may be some small occasion, some patients who might get that true cytokine storm, but a lot of our patients actually are, have, they have IL-6 levels no different than if you got garden variety. And in fact, the Serluzumab trial uh, over here, we are in phase three. We've enrolled about 60 patients in Serluzumab. Uh, it's now paused for a safety concern, particularly in people with severe disease. And so this is quite uh, troublesome to me. And, you know, TOSI is uh, initially everybody was using it off label. So lots of people got it, but we have no real control data. There is a tocilizumab trial that has just been started. Uh, but, you know, looked at, looking at serluzumab, which is also an IL-6 inhibitor, which is now paused for safety concerns, does should give us a little room for, you know, pause. We have to be careful, not panic and just throw just because you have it in your pharmacy is not an indication for giving it to the patient. Right. So that's very interesting data by both Dr. Sareen and uh, uh, Dr. Sanyal. And they suggested that possibly, I don't know whether it's cirrhotic or per se, patients have low IL-6 levels. And if cirrhotics have low IL-6 levels, I think that brings us to the next question. Why do these patients, why do these cirrhotics are more prone to develop severe disease if their IL-6 levels are low? suggesting a lower level of cytokine storm to Dr. Sareen. Sir, you are muted. You are muted, sir. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's a very good question. They are possibly their interferon levels are almost negligible. They're not able to make it. And secondly, the type of cell death in these patients is mainly hypoxic and drug-induced liver injury. They, they, once they get COVID, they are given outside, I don't know for what reason, azithromycin. And they were giving HCQ even for liver patients. You know, I mean, a guy who is sick enough, there is little justification of combining these two. So that is drug-induced liver injury, I think, is a common. Second, hypoxic liver injury is common. So what, the, to me, the best drug is, is pentoxifiline, which we regularly give to our patients. And of course, uh, try other methods, uh, you know, antioxidant methods. You don't have anything else. Uh, we also try and give some of these patients plasma. And uh, I think it is a reasonably good therapy. I'll tell you one more thing. The patient with cirrhosis, like a normal person who gets SARS-CoV-2, he himself makes antibodies which are 1 in 640 and above neutralizing antibodies by day 10. But in a cirrhotic, the neutralizing antibodies against CoV-2 are not formed. So despite the infection, you are not able to mount the antibody levels and therefore giving outside uh, enriched plasma may have a We don't have a randomized trial, but the few patients, I think it may be a help. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Chaudhary, do we have time or do we need to close down now? Do we have time for a couple of more questions? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, I believe quite a few people are waiting to hear Dr. 
uh, Sarin and Dr. Arun uh, Sanyal's responses. So I think that we can possibly continue for another 10 minutes. But okay. only thing is I want to reassure the audience that I'll try my best to get both the two people back on one other session at least so that, you know, this is not the last time you're going to meet them. Okay. So right. Karthal, uh, you have more questions or I start yeah. with the... Three I, I, I yeah. asked this one last question, Dr. Sarina, and then we can move to Dr. Sanya. So I think this question was from Dr. Uh, Ashwini Chopra. Uh, what about the differences in hepatic involvement in patients who have asymptomatic disease vis-a-vis -vis symptomatic disease vis-a-vis -vis severe SARS-CoV-2 disease? Uh, I do not know the difference between asymptomatic and symptomatic. There is little data on that. But one thing is there, those who have severe COVID, they have much more severe liver you know, decompensation for two reasons. One, that many of them are being given high dosages of steroids. You know, they're getting methylprednisolone to the tune of 100 to 200. And uh, that is one thing and it can precipitate many infections. Second, these patients are very prone to become sick because of bacterial, uh, the gut microbiota uh, changes. You know, I have at least noticed and we have uh, not too many of the non-liver patients COVID, but most patients with liver and SARS-CoV-2 also have diarrhea. I would say the frequency of 20% reported from Wuhan may be much less. I would say 50% of our patients present with diarrhea. And we think it may be SBP, but there is no SBP in these patients. We have tried to see uh, if there are any other bacteria, but they have diarrhea, so they have a very high chance of infection. To put it, therefore, Dr. Chopra, your question, I would say people who have severe COVID and have underlying cirrhosis, they are doomed. You need to put them into very high alert. Dr. Duseja. Okay. I think a lot of questions on uh, pharmacotherapy. Then, as we said, I think we will be discussing each of these molecules in detail in the further webinars. But then, the I think uh, people are asking. I mean, uh, let's not go into the details. But if you have to choose a patient for SARO, say today, or OCA, or for that matter, vitamin E, Professor Sanyal, what would be the ideal patients for say SARO, OCA, and vitamin E? And the next for SARO would be out of OCA and SARO, I mean, we know that SARO looks more safer, especially for Cirrhotix, where you said you will be a little hesitant in using OCA. So if there is a Cirrhotix, would you be, I mean, happy using SARO, though we don't have any data on Cirrhotix? So your take on this. So, you know, it becomes complicated when you don't have data and evidence, uh, because then, you know, like we joke sometimes on the ward, you are in the realm of eminence-based medicine and not evidence-based medicine. And that's a dangerous and thin ice to be skating on right. because too many people have fallen through that uh, trap. Uh, so personally, I think you have to make an individualized decision. So what I like to see is what is the extra hepatic profile and what is the hepatic profile. So I'd like to look at two buckets. If the person, most of our patients have risk factors, you know, risk factors doesn't necessarily mean they're about to die of their extra hepatic disease. And so, but if somebody is already diabetic, has got CKD, spilling protein, has retinopathy, you know, they have some uh, cardiac, they had two stents already placed, you know, in that kind of setting, it is very important for me that any drug I choose for the liver at least be neutral. From the cardio, from the extra hepatic point of view, uh, but uh, and from a liver point of view, uh, given that the best evidence for antifibrotic effect is still with the FXR class, you know, uh, and uh, then I think particularly for the subset of people who have active disease, who have stage three, but who have a relatively okay extra hepatic profile, given that nobody is completely pristine, you know, uh, uh, that might be your best OCA candidate for now. And whereas for sorrow, you know, uh, given that uh, most of these patients do have significant cardiovascular 
uh, you know, issues uh, that uh, for, the, for the rest of the patients, sorrow is a safer long-term uh, option. We do have tremendous amount of safety data with sorrow because it's been approved in India for some years now. There's no evidence that it causes any hepatotoxicity and its overall, you know, safety profile. And at least our experience with sorrow, obviously it's less than in India, uh, but uh, our experience is that the patients tolerate it incredibly well. Patients actually think this is no big deal. And given that it is improving lipid profile, everything else, I think for a lot of those other patients, I would lean the sorrow way and have OCA as a limited backup, as a, as a, as a tool. For those who th we think have active disease, who have stage three, we think they're almost, they're cr getting close to cirrhosis, uh, but have a reasonable extra hepatic profile that we don't think we're going to put extra hepatic risks. Also who are, at the same time don't have gallstones. You know, there is a signal in the regenerate for increased cholecystitis. And you know this, this this can be quite problematic because we're talking about a population that's already at high risk for gallstones. So I think all of that has to be factored in together in your decision making. I think again, Jim, do you agree? I, I would love to hear. You know, there's nobody I respect more as a clinical hepatologist than uh, is like my older brother, uh, Shiv. So Shiv, I'd love to get your feedback to see if you agree with what I just said. So you're mute, sir. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Uh, broadly, I have very limited experience of obitocolic acid, so I can't give you uh, suggestions. But yes, Saro is a safe drug. We have used it in uh, cirrhotics who are compensated. Uh, if you ask my choice of managing a NASH cirrhosis, it is metformin. Uh, we have a thesis, but the fellow left, so never got published. <laughs> but uh, it's the best drug, in my opinion, cheaper, brings the portal pressure down, fibrosis regression. But as far as the question whether we can give uh, uh, vitamin E in cirrhotics, uh, we generally uh, give but a lower dose in combination. Uh, but we don't know the benefits. OCA, I have not used. Saro, yes, it is safe and we have used. Okay, I think a lot of questions on the side effect profile for OCA, again, we will discuss in detail later. But the pertinent question is that for PBC, when you use OCA, it tends to bring down your alkaline phosphatase, but in regenerate and the other NASH data, the ALKFOS has gone up. So what is the likely explanation there? We leave aside so, the priorities for the time being. Yeah, there's a mechanistic basis for this. So in PBC, which is a cholestatic disorder, you already, already have massively upregulated, uh, uh, you know, alkaline phosphatase. And so you have two things going on. One, there is a direct effect of OCA that is increasing alkaline phosphatase but on the other hand you have reduction in cholestasis which is decreasing alkaline phosphatase and the improvement in cholestasis effect uh, is bigger than the direct effect of OCA. Now OCA there is a FXR response element in the promoter of uh, alkaline phosphatase that leads to an alternate splicing of the alkaline phosphatase so its trafficking is altered, so it actually makes the level go up. So it doesn't mean you're inducing cholestasis. It's, uh, there's already pharmacological data for that alternate splicing and altered trafficking of that alkaline phosphatase. So that occurs both in PBC. It's just a pharmacological effect of the drug. It occurs both in PBC and in, uh, in, and in uh, people with fatty liver disease. But in PBC, where there's already background cholestasis, the improvement in cholestasis has a bigger effect. You have two competing effects going in opposite direction. So your net effect is whichever is the larger. So that's the basis. Okay. 
and i think again some questions on the thoughts of uh, you know combining saro with oka the combination treatment i mean again there is no data i think we need to probably look at this but then what are your thoughts or everyone's thought on this combining these two one reducing predominantly necroinflammation and the other predominantly uh, reducing fibrosis so any thoughts on that yeah so you know i i i know that uh, people who put oka out there want to push this as a primary antifibrotic but i will tell you that there's still controversy about whether their effects are receptors on stellate cells and uh, so my personal belief is that much of the antifibrotic effect of oka is through its effects upstream on inflammation it has anti inflammatory effects and as shiv mentioned very correctly you know inflammation is what connects the metabolic stress to the fibrogenic response and so uh so it's a mixed effect uh yes it has clearly good antifibrotic signals and you could think about combining it if you did you might want to reduce the oka dose you know uh that you might be able to bring the oka dosing into a very safe range by combining it with something like saroglitazar but in the end you have to generate evidence you know otherwise it's just your opinion versus mine and you can say as you know from the news you can say anything you want <laughs> as long as you're not held to proving proving what you said is actually correct factually you, people are out there saying all kinds of things but that's not evidence based medicine i think we are short of time kaushal if you have any burning issues or the chair persons have any issue, uh, questions and then maybe the organizers can take it on yeah most of it has been answered by dr sareen uh, although there are a number of questions but since we don't have time we'll ask the chair persons to take over from here and possibly yeah. conclude yeah professor rao and professor palni swami you are mute sir you need to unmute yourself Uh, it was a wonderful meeting, and uh, we had a very good lecture by all the uh, all the uh, the speakers, and uh, the very good participation. I saw the numbers more than thousand uh, nine hundred participation. I think I be sure to thank uh, Dr. Gurdas Chaudhary for the initiative, and without uh, I would like to thank once again thank Dr. Chaudhary and all the uh, uh, panelists, uh, the speakers, and the participants. Thank you very much. Professor Rao, it's an exciting session. I think this forms the basis for our future series. You know, I think that those will be the much more interesting, and this has formed the basis for the future things. Thank you very much, and for involving me. Thank you, Dr. Gaur Chaudhary, and it's been good. Thank you. So we're being engaged from here. Uh, so. thank you my sincere thank to uh, professor dr anul arun sanyal uh, ms donna uh, skrayer and professor dr sir sarin uh, who presented their part very well and set the stage for uh, our conclave uh, my special thanks to our dear moderators and chair persons for today's session dr pn rao dr k r palani swami dr uh, kosal madan dr ajay duseja uh i am truly overwhelmed that approximately 2000 people registered for this event and uh, uh, they attended today's webinar uh no thanks is big enough i hope uh, all of you enjoyed today's session and uh, i will i promise we will keep your jaws quite high and uh, fulfill your expectations in our next webinar our next uh, uh, webinar is on uh, uh, 26 july at the 4:30 pm in which we will cover uh, the topics uh, on therapy uh, your feedback is quite important so kindly click the link and please fill the feedback uh, it will improve our next webinars i want to uh, say thanks to our organizing team our advisory teams and our executive committee Uh, i also want to thanks our sponsors uh, for the event jaidas uh, bionext and uh, our uh, event partner uh, surname touch so uh, thank you uh, we will uh, have uh, all of you on 26 july at 4:30 pm on bars thank you thank you very much thank you all thank you yeah thank you very much from my side as well okay thanks a lot thank, thank you, you. Bye, bye. We look forward to the next meeting. Bye. Thank you.